interested tools that empower developers to easily build innovative, decentralized, and mobile first applications. Brooke's going to be speaking to us about Software Unplugged, rewriting the rules of local first software. All right, hi. Oh. Is this picking me up? I don't think so. This one. OK. All right. Thanks, everyone, uh, for coming right after lunch. Hopefully, uh, uh, you know, we're going to digest and, and stay awake. So I'm going to try to get through this uh, inside the 40 minutes time uh, with a lot of energy and keep, uh, keep us all going. So uh, Software Unplugged. <laughs> Uh, rewriting the rules with local per software. Um, you know, we, we've been building software the same way for a really long time. Um, I worked as a uh, web dev for uh, quite a while before I got into research and uh, found that I was doing things the same way over and over and over again, kind of because it was the way things were done, not because there were some fundamental reason that it had to be done that way. And so, you know, at some point you have to think about how things could be different, and what if we flipped the trade-offs of our software and, and our approach? Or another way to say it is, what if we just burnt everything down and started again from scratch? <laughs> so my name is Brooklyn Zelenka. You can find me most places on the internet as Xpeed. Um, and I am, as of this past week, a senior researcher at an uh, industrial research lab called Ink and Switch, Woo! working on local first access control. Thanks. Um, I'm also the editor of the uh, UCAN Working Group, uh, which is a uh, uh, decentralized auth system. Uh, and years, many, many years ago, and just because I came up at lunch with a few people, uh, I was an Ethereum core developer as well. And uh, historically, my interests have been in programming languages and distributed systems. So uh, today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the current state of software, uh, what local first or lo-fi is. Um, the term originally came around in 2019, so you know what's new since then and some, some more recent context. Um, an experience report uh, from having done five plus years in uh, lo-fi, and a few developments looking forward to the next chapter for those of you that are interested in uh, contributing. So economic weight class, um, because one size does not fit all. I'm going to pick on Amazon Web Services a little bit here because they're the incumbent. They uh, currently serve something like 38% of the internet's uh, traffic. Um, this is the distribution of their data centers worldwide, uh, and I've uh, broken it down geographically for you. So it's mostly North America, Europe, and uh, the far east portion of Asia. And this makes sense, right? Data centers are super expensive. Um, they cost hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to build and maintain. Um, and so you can get these nice economies of scale where you can put a lot of them in places where you have paying customers, and you can avoid putting them in places that are completely uninhabited, like Central America and Africa. <laughs> Which is, of course, false, right? And uh, people are online in Central America and Africa. Um, if we want to think about population density, this circle has 50 million people in it, which is about how many people we have per data center in North America. In South America, it's about one for a half billion people. And in uh, Africa, it's about one and a half billion people per data center. Now, economically, if you're Amazon, this makes sense, right? The availability zone in uh, Cape Town, I believe, is the most expensive one, but they also have rolling blackouts. Um, you know, it, they don't have the economies of scale locally or the paying clientele for it. The systematic result of this is that there's very few places where people actually put servers. So if I want to send a, a DM from Winnipeg to Saskatoon, it's probably, in the best case scenario, it's going to go to the closest um, availability zone, which is in Seattle, and then all the way back across. More likely, it's going to end up in US East 1, which is in Virginia. But you know, let's, let's be generous here. Um, this is about seven and a half times more time, energy, carbon, and maintenance on all of the data centers, plumbing, et cetera, um, going between those places. Consequences of having infrastructure set up this way are that we think about there being a single source of truth. There's the database. It's a very server-centric worldview. 
We talk about things like full stack development. You have front end developers, back end developers. Um, we develop specialities like DevOps, Docker, Kubernetes. And this is a lot to train people to become software engineers to even launch an application at all. Um, LAMP was a nice abstraction back in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, and we've been stretching that metaphor for a really long time and trying to do things like containerization that just make it feel like the same way that we've been doing things for 25, 30 years. If we want to think about this high industrial uh, era, if you want something that can do absolutely everything, like one of these large data centers, a nice metaphor for this is it's like an aircraft carrier. It can go anywhere. It's completely self-sufficient. It has a crew of about 5,000 people and costs north of $8.5 billion. Um, and uh, this is the CNCF, like the Kubernetes um, uh, <laughs> ecosystem uh, for scale. Uh, so just to maintain this current way of doing things, these are individual companies that are required just to keep it running, right? <laughs> Never mind startups going under. Google famously kills products all the time. Yeah. Yep. What happens to your data? If you're technical enough and interested enough, maybe you can download that data, but more likely that data just disappears. We're living in a digital dark age where so many of your products go away and just, pff, they're gone. And when your data lives in a data center and has a single source of truth, you can lose data simply by not synchronizing your machines all the time and not always being online continuously. If you go through a tunnel and you're making changes, maybe you're going to lose those changes. So over the course of decades, and there's actually one prior to what I'm going to show here, there was you know, mainframes and you know, whatnot pr prior to this. Um, in the 80s and 90s, we had desktop computing, which was personal computing in the literal sense that there was one person computing. This is classical, isolated. In the 2000s and 2010s, we have impersonal computing, this very modernist, high industrial style. Scale, um, uh, large companies uh, running services. And it's always hard to say what exactly we're inside of at a particular time, um, but there's at least some movements towards agentic computing. Uh, and I use that term in a uh, pun on multiple levels of both uh, AI enabling more people, to, so AI agents, which then allow more people with uh, fewer um, uh, existing traditional technical skills to be equally effective in building software. Um, and creating software for smaller audiences, where the economics no longer require that you have an audience of 100 million people, you can build software for you and your friends, or you and your family. And having a total install base of four is totally fine. And this is interpersonal computing. It's postmodern, where there isn't a single worldview being imposed down, and it's potentially cozier with smaller groups. So unlike an aircraft carrier, Another way of getting around, I mean, I've never been on an aircraft carrier. I get around town on a bike. I cheat a little bit, it's an electric bike, um, but it has a crew of one, and it costs a whole lot less than eight and a half billion dollars. The internet today, um, and really if you want to do any collaborative software, uh, you're immediately in a class called uh, distributed systems, which is when you have more than one machine uh, collaborating uh, on, on a problem or on, on an application. Uh, Leslie Lamport, uh, who's a well-known um, uh, distributed systems researcher, um, has said that uh, the litmus test is a distributed system is one where a computer that you didn't even know existed, um, uh, a problem on, on that computer can render your own computer unusable. If Google's servers go down, or GitHub goes down, you get the morning off, right? Um, and uh, Martin Kleppman, one of the people that uh, coined the term distributed uh, uh, local for software, has said, by this definition, local first is not a distributed system because it is resilient to exactly this. Nobody else's computer should control whether or not you can run your software. So let's talk a little bit about lo local first. So usually when people think about local first, the first thought that they have is offline services. Um, and really, it's, it's on both, right? It's to say, if you go offline, everything continues to work, 
And when you come back online, uh, all the information that everybody else was doing synchronizes with you. You don't lose anything, and you will uh, uh, get a consistent view with everybody else. So it both works offline and online. It's local first, not local only. In 2019, Ink and Switch uh, published this manifesto that included seven ideals for local for software. The one that has been abs an absolute slam dunk is seam seamless co collaboration with your colleagues. Local for software makes collaboration really, really, really easy. So if you want to do, you know, live editing, text editing, think, you know, things like Google Docs, but where it actually continues to work if you're offline, um, Figma, you know, doing collaborative um, drawing, this sort of thing. These, I think, have been relatively successful as well. Um, no spinners, so you should never have a delay because of the network. Everything is happening locally, and then, and that's the source of truth, and then getting pushed up to the network. Your work is not trapped on a single device. You can have it replicated in lots of different places. The network is optional and is secure and private by default. We'll come back to that. Um, and then there are two in here that are longer term uh, thoughts. The long now and retaining ultimate control and ownership of your data. Um, CRDTs are a, a, an algorithm for doing um, uh, collaborative uh, uh, data. Um, and they're one style for uh, local first. Today, they're really the, the dominant technique uh, for this. And so, you know, the, the standard uh, demo for this is doing text editing. Um, you know, you can uh, write concurrently with somebody else, and uh, as soon as that's synchronized, you will see the same text document. Um, and this doesn't have to go through a central server at all. You can do this completely peer to peer. You could do this over Bluetooth, it would continue to work. One of you could go offline for a week, a month, 10 years, it doesn't matter, and come back, and as soon as those machines can talk to each other, you'll see the same document. One of the um, big changes that this creates is in a traditional tech stack, you have all of these moving parts that have come from the history of, in the 90s, we assumed that you had a beige box that lived under your desk that connected to the, the internet and that you would turn off from time to time. Um, and so you would rent a server somewhere, and that server was the source of truth. With local first software, we no longer need that to live in any particular place. So we can really collapse this down, and this makes it both conceptually simpler, easier to train, and um, uh, costs less to run. So this ultimately changes the experience and the economics of software. So, um, Quick iteration, focus on end users, because there's fewer, you know, less of, fewer abstractions between the developer and your end user. Maybe your end user is now even somebody that you know personally, rather than some you know, faceless hypothetical user. Um, lowers the barrier to entry, and uh, a term uh, actually Boris came up with was uh, ship your mocks. So instead of just prototyping something and then having to go and build all of this other stuff, your prototype is the final version. Um, we've seen local first software in a lot of places uh, without it having the big label on it, local first. So uh, Apple Notes, Figma, and arguably Jupyter Notebooks are all local first software. Uh, Apple Notes. Um, the constraints of a system uh, set the design space that you're able to work in. So when we had personal computing, you owned all of your software. It came on a disk or you typed it in, and nobody could take it away from you. In the era of cloud computing, we gained new capabilities. You could reach hundreds of millions of people. You have this you know, very collaborative, very real-time live system. right? You can do uh, watch parties with all of your friends on, from your phone. Um, but if their servers go down, or they turn that ser service off, you're kind of hooped. And now we have this new local first thing that we haven't 100% figured out what the, um, the degrees of freedom are. It constrains some things, and it makes other things much easier. In a traditional uh, system, we think about uh, the internet as being a source of truth, and the closer um, the information travels to you, it's essentially like having different caches. So the internet has the real thing, 
And then it comes down into disk, and then memory, CPU, cache, and then into your application. You can actually see it. And hopefully, um, uh, you're able to uh, keep things uh, cached locally so that if you, you know, uh, uh, go offline, you can still see something, but you might not be able to actually edit it. So Google Docs, for example, uh, if you turn your uh, Wi-Fi off, you can read the document, but you can't make any changes. And you'll get a little bar that says you're offline, reconnect uh, if you want to make any changes. In um, another way of doing this, and that we use in, in local first, is this cellular or peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, networking model, where each instance, each device, is a complete copy in itself. And there may even be multiple instances on a single machine. This is, in some ways, harder to think about because it's very messy, it's disordered, as opposed to this nice linear vertical system. But you only ever have to think about two at a time, and then they can replicate through each other. You won't know that everybody has the same data, so that some might be a little bit ahead, a little bit behind, might be slightly diverged, but when they all come back online and they all can reconnect, they will see the same document. Um, a lot of people, uh, including myself in the past, have tried to do this in a purely peer-to-peer -peer way. Turns out peer-to-peer -peer is really hard. Um, it's really awesome when it works, but it doesn't always work. So the pattern that we're starting to see adopted is to have a sync server uh, in the middle. So you can opportunistically do things totally peer-to-peer. -to -peer. You can do Bluetooth connection, send data back and forth. You're sitting next to somebody on a plane or going through, through a tunnel and you know, opportunistically continuing to you know, chat or edit some documents. Um, but when Bluetooth fails, which is known to do, um, being able to send something up to a server and back down um, as a fallback is always a good option. Um, and the intention in the community these days is to make these servers really simple, very dumb, stupid, so that anybody could run one and uh, they would work with any application. So this is one of the nice things about simplifying the stack from all these separate layers down into just smaller uh, number of moving parts is um, they're simpler to run and they're more generic. Because they're more generic, that means that we can now federate data, not applications. We can load the same data in multiple different contexts. So I could have some music and I could load it into a video game or a music player have some images get used across applications. If I don't like your application, maybe I can load that same data in a different one. And then all of these tools become reusable. So it's not just that it's open source. With standards in particular, um, the ability to have a file explorer that can open up the data from any application, and you can go and look through it. Um, means that we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel inside of every single application. We can break things apart uh, in, in these nice ways. But, as I said before, there's this um, uh, uh, new, uh, in, in any new system, it's going to be a little bit, um, there's new things that we have to discover along the way. So today, you know, with SaaS software, things are pretty okay, right? They, they could be better, they could be worse. We definitely don't want to end up with something that's much worse, but we don't know where the other peaks in the design space are. So it's still pretty early days, and we're still trying to find our way up to these next, um, uh, these new peaks that are hopefully better than what we currently have. But uh, being so early, that means that there's just a lot of infrastructure that just doesn't exist yet. So it's still quite, quite early. Um, as much as we want to say, you know, boo, bad SaaS, and, you know, good local first, um, sometimes having those really mature systems can enable this next wave of innovation. So uh, starting with things that are really high visibility, like new algorithms or new protocols that get people really excited, that get, you know, people into a room like this, and then they become, over time, commoditized and boring, but they can then um, enable this next wave of innovation. So having something like a sync server that runs on top of whoever, Cloudflare, AWS, anyone like this, gives us the ability to slowly transition off of SaaS in the traditional sense. There's also, um, uh, from the economic perspective, um, 
whether we like it or not, we live under capitalism, and to uh, uh, keep the development of these technologies going, they do need funding. People have to, you know, researchers have to eat, developers have to eat. Um, and as things get more commoditized and get more boring, uh, typically the value goes higher. The challenge of this is that um, you can have a completely distributed thing like Git, you know, version control, and it can get captured and turned into a centralized SaaS service. Um, there's this lovely book, uh, The Master Switch, yeah, um, that talks about um, uh, all of these different networking technologies and how they've become captured over time. And then a new technology comes out and opens the space again and then slowly gets locked down. So on one hand, it's really great that you can run stuff yourself. People tend to not self-host, right? You can use the store-bought version. The hope is that with local for software and some you know, related uh, software movements, that we can lock things open at least longer this time. So the um, four principles <laughs> are to empower users to participate. Anybody should be able to run a sync server, for example. You should be able to leave without loss. You should be free to exit and take your data with you and go somewhere else. You should have control over your own data. You should feel safe online and uh, decide who's able to see your data, who's allowed to change it, and provide capacity to others. Those are all really nice principles. We sometimes say this like telling somebody to eat your vegetables. <laughs> At the end of the day, somebody still needs to run these services. And again, historically, we haven't seen people really self-hosting en masse. So we, uh, an area where Local First hasn't really figured things out yet is what is the pure business model? There are Local First inside of other things, but as I noted before, Apple Notes is technically Local First software, right? You can go offline, edit things, come back online, and it'll synchronize you know, with, with anybody else who's sharing that, uh, that note. Um, Apple um, is not what I would call like a, you know, uh, uh, hippie self-hosting system, right? Like, they've embedded it inside of this very um, SaaS, locked down, walled garden system. So we need to find some way to align those incentives uh, over time. Um, just in the past couple months, I've seen now a little bit more discussion about this, but nobody has really found, I think, a, a compelling way of doing this. And so I think it's actually the economics are um, uh, something that have to get solved before this can really um, flourish over time. So from the, from the field, uh, five years, five plus years of lo-fi. So um, this here again, um, ultimately, you know, you have this giant stack, hard to reason about, hard to learn, hard to run. I know we've constrained this other stack with this new uh, uh, set of technologies. Um, there's this idea uh, from Larry Tesler, Tesler's Law, that says there's a fundamental amount of complexity in a system that you can't get rid of. You can move it around, but you can't get rid of that bottom layer of, of complexity. Um, so we've made this much simpler. Um, how hard could it be to build an, an application in this, in this style? So at my previous company, Fission, uh, we uh, developed a roadmap and we got basically to the top of this thing. Um, it is uh, a lot of moving pieces because what we don't um, uh, often think about are all of the commodity pieces that exist in web browsers, in Nginx, you know, in, in, in web servers, in all of these things that have built, been built up in those 30 years. So even if we're moving into this um, era and in, into this movement of local first where it doesn't really care so much about like what exactly the network transport is. Um, it still needs things like synchronization. Well, okay, I'm going to pull all the data, but I'm on a low powered phone that doesn't have infinite storage. So what's the data that I need to pull down? And nobody has really built a really robust selective synchronization mechanism yet. So there's a lot of work that has to happen to go into this. Um, yeah. <laughs> Things that I should have been clicking through as we go. Um, in a traditional uh, stack, so when, when we started out on these projects, um, we thought about this in, in the same way that um, traditional software works, right? You have a data layer at the bottom, 
then you have compute layer uh, in the middle, and then you have auth at the top. But in local for software, when your data moves around everywhere, you can't have a compute layer that guards access to, um, uh, to your service. So it turns out that auth isn't a separable concern anymore. Auth has to get baked in at the bottom layer, which essentially nobody has done today. Um, so obviously, I'm biased. I'm working on a, uh, I've done a bunch of local first auth stuff in the past. I'm working on an auth project right now with Ink and Switch. Um, but uh, time, and, time and again, auth is at the bottom, data is in the middle, and compute is at the very top. So decentralizing trust. And this is uh, both in traditional access control as well as how we handle the data and resources themselves. So when people are building the initial versions of things, essentially toy projects, um, you don't have to think about auth. And you don't have to think about like, oh, like, you know, if I want to compact some data or delete some data, um, it's just me and my friends. And you know, it's, it's fine if we have to blow the app up and, and start again. If you're always in this pull-based world, where you're saying, um, I have my own view of, view of things, and I'm going to pull in changes manually. Um, everything is, is easy and simple and abundant. As soon as you move into a world of push, where you're saying, I'm going to take this data and put it somewhere else, uh, you end up in this very scary other set of trade-offs in scarcity. Uh, one of my all-time favorite quotes, um, cryptography is a tool for turning lots of different problems into key management problems. Um, both terrifying, so if anybody's ever done key management, this is a, a capital H hard problem. Um, but uh, on the flip side, this gives you an abstraction. So if you've turned things into key management and you start solving for the really hard, hard problem that is key management, that we now have some more building blocks for, like pass keys um, and the Web Crypto API and, um, uh, and actually pretty robust libraries, then we're able to move access control around with the data itself directly. Um, because it's no longer, data is no longer trapped inside of single applications, one way of thinking about this is that there's a universal data layer that everybody has access to over the network, and that you get a certain slice of it based on what you're able to retrieve and decrypt. Um, and that's because you're able to now load data between different applications or even fork an application and fork the data, it's a question of what slice, what is in your light cone of data that you're able to access? Um, one way of handling this is with a technique called in encryption at rest um, and uh, maintaining keys that can then contain blocks of data that contain other keys. This makes it very easy to manage an unbounded number of keys by just sharing a single key with somebody. So you can think of this as a URL with a bit of uh, key material in it that then gives you access to a huge tree of data. Um, the really hard part with this is maintaining this over time. Files need to change over time. Once something's encrypted, it's effectively solidified and sealed. Um, and you want to be able to change this um, to create new versions of a document, to create new edits to it, uh, and to bring more people in and kick people out. Bringing people in is easy, you hand them a key. Kicking them out is hard, because now you have to change the key and reshare these keys. Turns out that even with the best of intentions, sometimes auth accidents happen, um, and it's, you've given the key to the wrong person. Um, that means that you have to come and remove them from a system. But if the data lives absolutely everywhere, there's no real way to guarantee that it's gone. Right? This is still the same case as in, in SaaS. Like somebody can take a screenshot of an application, but you can make it much harder for them to get access to data if they didn't think about taking the screenshot in the first place. Um, this is effectively an unsolved problem. There are some ways of handling it. If you have a sync server that everybody depends on, you can remove that data. Um, but uh, um, you can't prevent somebody from creating another server that others can, you know, and them resharing that information. 
because of this, a lot of people want to depend directly on cryptography. Cryptography isn't enough. You have to actually remove access to the resource at the network layer. Um, and uh, all cryptography is breakable. So even if you have the coolest, newest post-quantum cryptography, all of this stuff, that will be broken eventually. Will be broken tomorrow, will be broken in 10 years, will be broken in 50 years, who knows? Um, but all cryptography is fundamentally breakable. Now, um, trust goes beyond access control, It also things like computation. Should you trust, if somebody built an index over your data, should you trust that index? If they compact data and say, here's the, because you don't have an infinite amount of space to hold the entire history of everything, I want to compact it down and have a, just a slice of it, how do I trust that that compaction is correct? So uh, really, your options, I mean, this is a whole field of options, but uh, today, people really trust some central server. Um, we're starting to see optimistic um, uh, updates where maybe you'd have somebody submit a proof to say, like, hey, I also ran, you know, three of us also ran this, and we got a different result. Um, and over time, I think things will move towards um, uh, zero knowledge proofs. So for those that haven't seen such a thing before, you can get a mathematical proof. It's about 32 bytes. That proves that some arbitrary computation was done correctly, uh, which is Pretty mind-blowing. It runs a little bit slow. So to wrap up and to point away with a, a bit of a further roadmap, um, this is the uh, technology adoption curve. A lot of people think that we are trying to cross the big scary chasm, this one here. Uh, we're not. Uh, we're currently trying to jump this smaller chasm. <laughs> so it's people who uh, have been working on this for a few years who have built everything from scratch, and uh, you know, it's this very high salience thing. Local for software is kind of like a you know, cool buzzword, and we're now moving into early adopters, where you need to have things like access control, sync, selective replication, all of this stuff. It, has, it creates a completely different set of trade-offs uh, for than the audience that are innovators. So these, these folks like it. It's going to be the cool kids next, and we need to go from weird hackers in their bedroom to people actually using this stuff for real. Uh, this means it is exciting times in both senses. Um, really exciting new technology all the time, but also uh, maybe slightly too exciting if uh, your software doesn't work all the time. Uh, there's lots of low-hanging fruit for people to, uh, to work on. There are no real frameworks yet. There's no like rails of local first or a LAMP stack for local first. There's a couple starting attempts at this, but we're still very, very early in those days. Um, things are still very manual. It's an investment. And there's no hand-holding. Um, some of the tools are pretty good. AutoMerge, YJS, these are pretty good tools. But you need this whole other stack uh, on top of it. Um, so it's like exploring this new design space, this new planet. Um, you can go and you can try things out, and there is a glory, you know, some people think of it as, as having the glory of having, you know, the tire tracks uh, on this, this surface. But there are no houses here yet. Um, and also, remember, we don't know what these um, degrees of freedom are. So Local First is really great at human sizes and speeds, but it is harder to do global things. If you want to build a uh, something that ingests the blue sky fire hose, no longer the Twitter fire hose, um, doing things for global discovery, large data, and anything that is in some sense objective, where it's the global view, um, is much harder. So uh, picking the right problems and composing them together in such a way to say, OK, I've got my local small world view, and then I'm going to go up to a server and get the large world view. Um, open problems for this next era, if we want to see local first continue. Identity, trust, and encryption. So identity is a separate thing from access control. Uh, lossless data interoperation. Resource control, so the ability to say, I'm allowed to use a terabyte of storage on this server or not. Um, frameworks for composing together data. Um, verifiable and collaborative computation in addition to just data. Um, the ability to undo mistakes that people have made uh, in, in their um, 
uh, in their application. And I think really the big one is business models. So um, I'm really excited to see people try lots of different approaches uh, to things. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, a lot of them won't work, but hopefully we find some, uh, some new cool applications along the way. And uh, yeah, this is the latest plea of attention from the web. And we're going to have an open platform this time, and this time we mean it. Thank you. Great. Okay, we have time for questions. I see a hand. We unfortunately are still rocking. Just one mic. Test. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, that was a hard gig to do in the graveyard shift after all trying to <laughs> digest our food. That was really, really good. Uh, just a couple of comments. Really. Okay. If anyone is not aware of it, there's a thing called Brazilio Sync. Uh, which is from the people who originally did BitTorrent before they sold out. And I use it at home, it's like for your lab or virtual machines, you can move things around. If you turn your card over, the main sponsor of this thing is Holochain, which is this man here. And everything you said resonated is exactly what these people are doing. Uh, they've been at it all up. I mean, there's a gap in the middle, but about 11 years. And they started with BitTorrent, and now they've got the whole thing happening peer to peer toolkit. Mm -hmm. There's a catalog now, they're replacing what used to be Twitter, all that stuff, it's all happening. So mm -hmm. it's just, this is just a plug. Just go to holochain.org and there's a developer about holochain. It'd be good if you knew Russ, which is hard. Uh, what else? Um, well, you mentioned uh, decentralizing trust. Mm -hmm. There's something called DP, which is decentralized PKI. Mm -hmm. And that might be the answer to fight quantum ultimately, because if you I know you, not many people here do it, but if you actually download movies or something, you, you get all these bits that eventually, ultimately, coalesce into a file that you can use. And that's the idea of DPKI, where your identity is spread all over everywhere. So there is no way to hack it. It's quite good. Um, yeah, that excellent presentation. Thanks very much. Is this? No, OK. <laughs> Ooh, all right. Uh, yeah, so I've uh, been following Holochain for a long time. I love the project, it's fantastic. I think the hard part of all of these is making them, uh, like all of these parts and you know PKI and whatnot, making them usable. So um, as an example, Zuko's Triangle, right? Um, says you can have something that's human readable, uh, decentralized, or cryptographically secure, pick two. Um, and uh, having public keys is not like super, legible to, to most people. As soon as you've exposed a public key to an end user, you've effectively lost. Um, there's some really interesting um, uh, approaches to this that a few people have proposed but haven't implemented yet, like plugging into email and DKIM. So you can have the cryptographic signature from Google, who is a well-trusted source, um, or if you run your own mail server, you, know, you can also decentralize it this way, but now suddenly your identifier is email. Um, which is something that people are already, like, was email particularly, you know, friendly in, you know, 1989? No, but now everybody understands it and, and uses it. So we've already done that education. So the really hard part of these things is the um, uh, making them user friendly. Um, so I've been around for too long. Um, in the 1980s and early 1990s, we had all these problems. Uh -huh. uh, we had actually quite a few solutions. Uh -huh. For instance, in the early 1990s, we had the equivalent of Zoom over multicast Embo. Uh -huh. And it uh, worked great, um, even over variable bandwidths. And then someone said, oh, but it, how do we make it work on Windows 95? And the answer is you can't. Uh -huh. So, and 95% of those technologies were Oh, but they don't work on a single user system that fundamentally doesn't have any idea of protection from users. So I observed, for instance, that the reason why people started using webmail was because the Windows 95 single computer in the home 
provided no privacy between the members of the home household, but a webmail would. Mm -hmm. Okay, so fundamentally, everything got thrown out in 1995, and um, it continues to be thrown out. Mm -hmm. So, honestly, the older computers, even OS X on Mac, so much more advanced than even what we have here in Windows 11 today. Mm -hmm. Okay, and honestly, if you, you know, how many people in this room have an IPv4 at their house with, on a real computer? Yeah, I'm the only one. How many, oh, there's one over there. How many of you have an IPv6 at your home? A few more. Right. Why? Because we have prioritized being a consumer over being a citizen. And that's why we don't have distributed networks as you would like, because we actually aren't on the internet. We're on the cloud, mm -hmm. the end of the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have to fundamentally fix that. And if we don't, it continues to be cloud, because mm -hmm. that's the only stable place anyone can be, and you said it yourself, we need a synchronization server somewhere out there, and I'm like, why? You don't need that. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could, could not agree more. Uh, local for software fundamentally does not require a sync server. You need to be able to move the bytes somehow. The hope is that we can change the economics in such a way that you don't have to create a specialized class of people that have had the education, time, and experience to build things at scale, that you can build much smaller software, like we did in the 80s and 90s, and that has kind of fallen off since. It's become too expensive to run, right? Um, I keep coming back to this point on business models, because by radically reducing the cost of building and uh, running and maintaining software, um, we make it easier for individuals and smaller groups to actually run something for, for real. Um, but if we want to see the technology develop, I mean, I saw this in my previous company, I see this at the software lab now, is where's the funding coming from, right? And so ultimately it comes down to what is the business model to develop the technologies to do these things as much as we want it to, to live in this wonderful world where everybody has a very high degree of agency. Um, we have to make it align, we have to align the priorities and the, the incentives uh, with the, the broader um, economy in, in, in which these things get built. So it's a hard problem that I haven't seen a, a, a solution for yet. History is littered with super cool tech that didn't make it for not a fault of its own, absolutely. Um, I'm hoping that we can take some stuff out of uh, local first and have that continue because nobody can prevent you from running it completely locally without a server.